thank you, Steve Irwin, for asking. Your question immediately raises a variety of other questions, such as, what is money really and what can they do for me? Is it a trick? And what is a financial house in Holland? Because the questions are thus so many, and because I'm only one ass, I have a special guest in the studio today, economist and expert in the history of money, John Kenneth Galbraith, who's speaking to us through time from the age of uncertainty, the year 1977. So, Mr. Galbraith, one of the questions that comes up is, what is money really and what can they do for me? Is there any simple answer to that? Money buys access to all parts of the human carnival, all the booths at the fair. It ranks with love as man's greatest source of joy and with death as his greatest source of anxiety. Money differs from an automobile, a mistress, or cancer in being equally important to those who have it and those who don't. Now that is beautifully phrased, but can you please tell me what you're really saying? The reality is a bit more grim. Over all of history, money has oppressed people in one of two ways. Either it has been very abundant and very unreliable, or it has been reliable and very, very scarce. But for many people today, it has a third fault. It is both unreliable and scarce. So money are unreliable. Are you saying that maybe Stephen Irwin and I shouldn't bother with them at all? Or is there, in your opinion, any good point in money? The first service of money is to avoid the inconvenience of barter, the problem in the direct exchange of butter for horses or a house. But what about the whole financial house in Holland thing? Is that in fact relevant? A critical step in the history of money was taken here in the city of Amsterdam in the early 17th century. By 1600, hard coin money was abundant in Amsterdam as also throughout Europe. Silver and gold had been flowing into Europe from the New World. This flow is demonstrating the most elementary proposition regarding money. The more abundant the money, everything else equal, the less it will buy. Because money was abundant, prices everywhere in Europe were rising. What did the people of Amsterdam do when the abundance of wealth all around made each their personal fortunes lose their value? There was that irresistible urge to tamper with the money, to sweat and clip the coins and make less metal do the work of more. The range and variety and quality of the coin available in Amsterdam was appalling. No one could now be certain, when he received a coin, what he was getting. But still, it's obvious to us today that this didn't mean the end of money, so I guess the good people of Amsterdam found a way to save their asses. How did they do that? They created a bank, and the bank solved the problem of the quality of coins. A merchant brought his wretched coins to the bank. The bank weighed them. The deposit of the pure metal was then made to the merchant's account in the bank. This deposit was a highly reliable form of money. A merchant could transfer it to another merchant. The recipient knew that he was getting honest weight, that there was nothing funny. So they created the first financial house in Holland, but it wasn't funny. What did they do about that? Then came the second discovery. The deposits that were so created did not need to be left idly in the bank. They could be lent. The bank then got interest, and the borrower had a deposit to his account that he could spend. But the original deposit still stood to the credit of the original depositor, and that too could be spent. Wow, the financial houses in Holland made it possible to spend the same money twice? That definitely sounds funny, and also kind of magic. No one should rub his or her eyes in amazement. Money, spendable money, had been created. Something that's still being done every day. And creation of money by a bank is as simple as that. Oh, and here I was rubbing my eyes. But like any magic show, I guess we can still enjoy it even when we know the magician is playing us tricks. Even then we may ask with admiration how it's done. 
So, Mr. Galbraith, how is it really done? The important thing is that the original depositor and the borrower must not come at the same time for their deposits, for their money. They must trust their bank. They must, in a sense, believe that the bank isn't doing what it is doing. So that is why you, Stephen Irwin, also wrote me in your letter that all you need from me is my trust. I guess trust is, in fact, always the real value behind any currency. Now that I realize that, I also realize that I haven't been economical with my trust. And over the years, I have thoughtlessly spent it all without thinking about later. First of all, I've spent and lost quite a bit on trusting in my heart, and for a while I believed that success and happiness was achieved by investing large amounts of trust in myself. The biggest amount of trust, however, has been spent just recently on any online assholes who would offer to make the administration of my life easier and less time-consuming. And the fact is that, even though you offer a good price for my trust, I simply haven't got any trust left to trade, so sorry I can't help you, but thanks for your question anyway.